Hello, hello. All right, thank you guys for joining us and welcome to this webinar. Can all of you guys see the closed captioning? I wanna make sure that if you wanna see the closed captioning, all you have to do is just click on the live transcript button at the bottom. You'll see the CC icon right there and you'll be able to see the live captioning. All right, hopefully we don't have to wait any longer. My name is Melissa and we are going, and this is with Combo, and we are really thrilled and honored to have the space to be able to recognize um, Asian American Pacific Islander Month. And I know that this month, or really this year, there's been a lot of things that have been going on with our community. And yet, you know, how do we really, you know, as a community, you know, we learn, uh, we learn to, you know, as a group, you know, really, you know, all the things that we want to do today is to share our hearts and share our narratives with all of you. And so we are going to introduce Lee and Tang. And so we have to congratulate her because she actually just got her master's degree from Gallaudet just recently. So congrats to Lee Ann. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you and then we'll take it from here. Thank you, Melissa. All right, well, first of all, to all of you here, I hope that you've been doing well and thank you for being here. We have the slides here and we also thank Compo for giving us this platform to be able to talk about this very important issue. You know, I'm the moderator today. And again, my name is Leanne Tang. And my background, uh, my background is a green uh, is a green screen along with a black shirt and black hair, and I am a Asian American. All right, let's go on to the next slide, please. So before we get going, um, you know, I wanted to recognize this land. Uh, we want to give an acknowledgement, and so um, this uh, land used to be called Turtle Island, and now it's uh, what's called uh, North America. And we would like to recognize um, these different tribes, the, the Alabama Cushada, the, the Caddo, the Carrizo slash Khmer Carudo, the Kohulatekan, the Comanche, the Kickapoo, the Lapan Apache, the Tonkawa and Isleta del Sur Pueblo and all of the American Indian and indigenous people and communities who have been or have been a part of these lands and territories in Texas. Right now, you know, we wanted to take a moment and just recognize all the things that have been occurring um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to give a moment of silence for all that's happened. Okay, next slide please. All right, I'd like to introduce and recognize our panelists for today. And so I'll read off their names and then they'll come and introduce themselves. All right, Joey, thank you. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Joey. Hello, I'm Joey. That's my sign name. And just a description of my background. I'm wearing a yellow cap. I'm wearing round glasses that are black. I have curly hair. I'm wearing a black t-shirt. And on the left-hand side, it says Filipino town in white text. Uh, I have a white wall behind myself. 
and I'm sitting on a gray couch. And I'm happy to be here with all of you as you guys watch. Great, thank you. Let's go ahead and have Bilal. Hello, my name is Bilal Chinoy. This is my sign name. And just a background description, I'm sitting in front of a green wall. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and I have a uh, light beard and I put my hair in a man bun and I'm dark brown skinned. And uh, my background, you know, I grew up uh, in India and then I immigrated here at the age of 17 in 2001. And the reason why is because I wanted to attend Gaida University to obtain an education. I've since graduated and, um, and now I work for uh, several small organizations and one of them is Achievers. And so the goal is to support deaf uh, children in India. And I also um, established another organization uh, for Indian Sign Language uh, Connection. And the reason why we've done that is that due to uh, COVID and the pandemic, you know, many of the, <clears throat> many of the individuals uh, in the deaf community in India have been disconnected. And so my wife and I, we've established an organization to give, um, you know, online education for those communities. And so we have a hundred, over a hundred students that are currently signed up for that. And so that's a little bit about my background. And uh, please uh, in, uh, also mention your pronouns as well. Uh, I am a he, him. All right, thank you. We'll go back to Joey and so he can add his background as well and his pronoun. All right, excuse me, sorry about that. I forgot to give a little bit more information about myself. Uh, my pronouns are Thea and that's a Filipino word and that means uh, he, her. And so my background um, entails that I was, you know, I grew up here in America. Um, and so I would consider myself a Filipino American. Um, my parents moved from the Philippines um, in search of a better life and education and to provide that opportunity for uh, their children. And so currently, um, you know, I'm in the process of graduating with my master's um, in sign language education. And then I plan on becoming a teacher. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mija. My last name is Jung Sanderlin. And just a little bit about my, back, uh, my background. Um, I am sitting in front of a bamboo wall. I'm wearing a white um, top. It's technically a uh, traditional uh, Korean attire called hanbok. And there are some flowers on here. Uh, it's a little hard to see. Um, I have black hair that comes down to my shoulders and I'm wearing uh, round glasses. And a, I am a light skinned Korean individual. And just a little bit more about myself and where I'm from. Um, I was born and raised in South Korea. Um, I moved in the year 2008 for education. And now I work um, at a school as an art teacher. And I want to encourage, you know, uh, children to be more creative and to be more expressive and to make sure that they can have an outlet to express themselves. And my pronouns are she, her. Great, thank you. And Sachiko. Hello. My name is Sachiko. This is my sign name. And my last name is Flores. My pronouns are she, her. And my background behind me is a light gray, bluish kind of back a wall. I'm wearing round glasses. I'm olive skinned. And my hair is a mix between purple, blonde, and some dark hairs. Kind of like cotton candy colored. And I'm wearing a uh, dark blue t-shirt, navy colored. And my background, um, essentially I was born in America, just like Joey, you know, I'm a first generation American and my dad is um, Mexican and my mom is Japanese. And so I'm biracial. 
And now, um, after having lived here, you know, I kind of have two different hats that I wear in terms of work. I'm a co-executive uh, director of a nonprofit organization. It's an international organization called uh, Discovering Deaf World, uh, abbreviated as DDW. And the other role that I'm in, I'm a co-founder and I, the operation director of another nonprofit organization called uh, Core Than That. And so, you know, the reason why I'm in both of those roles is because I want to support, you know, the international communities that are out there. There are a lot of different deaf communities that are out there. And, um, and so we want to organize and, you know, build up those organizations internationally and empower those communities that are out there. And then and also the other one that I'm involved, you know, I'm very adventurous. I'm very outside, you know, we're, uh, you know, I very, very much value the environment and being a conservationalist. And so, you know, that, that organization, it provides a lot of opportunities to go out and explore. And so those are the two roles that I am in. All right, thank you. And I'll introduce myself briefly. My pronoun are she, her, and my identity, my identity is as an Asian American. Um, I was originally from China and then moved to America. And I'd like to let you guys um, know that all the individuals who are in the panel, um, they're sharing their stories and their journeys. So let's be respectful of that. Thank you very much. All right, first we have a poll. So please go ahead and vote on this poll when you can. And so while you are answering all the questions on the poll, I'll go ahead and sign and expand on them. So the first one is, what is your identity? Is it East Asian, Southern India, Southeast Asian, uh, Western Asian, Pacific Islander, Black, Hispanic, Native American, Indigenous, a white, mixed race. The second question is, how old are you, your age? And so are you 18 to 21, 22 to 25, 26 to 30, 31 through 35, 36 through 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and then 60 or above. And your identity, are you deaf, deaf blind? Are you deaf disabled? Are you hard of hearing? Are you a CODA? Are you a SOTA? So wait. All right, so it looks like about 70% of uh, our participants have voted. We'll just give a little bit more time. Um, there's, um, I apologize to those who are not able to complete the poll. Hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to submit the poll. We'll go ahead and close it now. Yeah, it's great to know uh, who's out in the audience for us. Um, and so it looks like uh, for Eastern Asian, we have about 27%. Uh, for Indian, we have 7%. We have, for Southeast, we have 18%. Pacific Islander, we have 4%. Black, 16%. Hispanic, 7%. White, Caucasian, 22%. Mixed race, 11%. That's great. We have a great diversity here. All right, so most of the ages that are here are around 40 to 50 years old. And we have individuals from 25 all the way through 60 and older. And I can share the results, it looks like.
And so it seems like there's a lot of deaf. There's some deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing. Great. All right, so now that the poll is over, we can go ahead and move on. All right, so since this is the month of May and we're honoring Asian American Heritage Month, uh, we really wanna thank Convo again for giving us this platform. Um, AAPI, I'm Asian American Pacific Islander. Um, you know, we've been spotlighting it a good number of times and, and really there's a lot more exposure that we need to have. And so that's why we're having, you know, utilizing this platform to discuss more about that. And so here's our question. Why do you think Asian invisibility, Asian American visibility is important? If you would like to come on camera, we can go ahead and answer that question. And so panelists, I probably can't see, so you're gonna have to probably come on camera yourself. All right, perfect. Thank you for all being here. Um, and so whoever raises their hand, we'll go ahead and spotlight you and then you will give your response. And so would you like me to repeat the question? Okay, so, you know, Asian visibility, you know, why is that important to you? Joey, go ahead. So Joey speaking here, um, you know, Asian visibility is really important to me. And the reason why is because, you know, it's about our stories and being able to share that and making sure that we feel recognized and having that authentic um, inclusion as well. Um, you know, from my upbringing, you know, I'm used to having people, you know, explain stories for me. And I'm used to having that perspective and allowing people's experiences, you know, influence me. And so now I'm don't, you know, I'm here at this point, and as I've been thinking and reflecting with everything that's been going on, I've realized that, yes, you know, my own story is important as well, as is everyone else's. And so that's why Asian visibility is important to me. All right, thank you. Yes, I definitely agree. Would anyone else like to add? So Chico, go ahead. Okay, so I think, you know, it's part of the, uh, an answer to mental health as well. You know, we're, America is a melting pot and there's a wide variety of individuals that are here. And, you know, the reason why I mentioned about mental health is that, you know, it, it does, there is some aggravation in terms of, you know, knowing that, you know, America, you know, we do see all these different races and, but uh, Asian Americans are not talked about often. And so that's why, you know, as, you know, I've become older, you know, I think about things that, you know, why didn't we learn about that before? And, you know, about certain exposures that we've had before, you know, how do we make sure that people are aware about this? How do we figure that out? And so that's why I like being a part of this panel and being able to give different perspectives of our upbringing. And, you know, sometimes, you know, Asian Americans, they might be, you know, more silent on certain things and they, you know, tend to isolate and, you know, that causes a lack of a support system occasionally. And it's important to support one another. And so that way we can be confident and be proud of where we stand today. Ninja? And so, you know, I grew up in South Korea and so, you know, the culture was the same. Everyone has the same hair, similar skin color. And so it was very easy, you know, and very easily understood to be around everyone. But here, you know, it's completely different and everyone looks different. Everyone, there's different skin colors, there's different body shapes and, you know, the languages are very as well. But for the month of, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander, you know, and there's a wide variety of backgrounds, even in our smaller um, population as well. And so that means that, you know, we should be learning about learning, uh, we should be learning about representation and how 
um, you know, we should be sharing that and having more visibility so people can look up to that, especially amongst the Asian American community. Yes, I agree. And Bilal? And so, you know, I agree with that diversity um, term as well. You know, I think that's powerful. You know, I grew up in India and I, when I moved to America, I experienced a lot of diversity here. And I think that, you know, it really opened my mind and it gave me a really rich experience uh, with all the different cultures and language and food and, you know, all of that and seeing that in myself, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure that we're represented as well in this diversity. And I also think that, you know, you know, we often tend to see, you know, Asian Americans, you know, we view Asian um, Americans, but that doesn't include Indian people because uh, for whatever reason, you know, we're not a part of that, that visualization of Asian Americans. You know, typically they view, you know, they think of Chinese people or maybe Eastern Asian people, but not India, not Southern Asian individuals, and not other parts of Asia. And also a funny story, you know, when I came here to America, you know, I missed Indian food so much that, you know, I was so excited. I went to a restaurant that had Asian food. I looked at the menu, but there was no Indian food. It was just East Asian food. And I always thought that, you know, it should be under Asian food. But, you know, I really wanna emphasize that, you know, when you talk about Asian, you know, there's over 40 countries. And so all of those need to be represented as well. All right, I agree, Bilal, you know, Asia should not just be thought of as the Eastern Asian countries, but we should give recognition and awareness to all of those countries that are there. And Bilal, did you wanna add? Um, something I wanted to add as well, you know, not to forget is that you know, there's a lot of contributions that Asia has given to, um, to America. You know, you know um, India has contributed um, the highest percentage of doctors um, and Asia in general has contributed the highest percentage of doctors to America. And so uh, I think it's important to make sure that we work together to make America even better. And yes, uh, when we work together, um, it can really become an awesome place. And so I really, you know, appreciate, you know, our Asian culture and, you know, does anyone want to share that right now? So Chico. Wow. Well, I consider myself biracial. I'm Mexican and I'm Japanese. And how often do I meet other biracial people, especially those who identify the same way I do? So. Honestly, I, I really cherish and I am proud of who I am and those who are, are similar to me. I don't know a lot about the, the Japanese side of, of me. Because of World War II, that side of the family immigrated here. My mother was born in Mexico because of that immigration and my father is Mexican. And so I don't really know a lot about my, my Japanese culture. I know a lot about my Mexican culture because that was the way I was raised. But sometimes I wonder about my Japanese culture and I'm looking forward to maybe one day um, going there. I did live in Thailand for two years and I was interning there. My boss there was Japanese. And so we would go out to eat dinner at night and, and just get to know each other and have a nice time. My boss would ask me about my background and told me that there is a word for an individual who's biracial. And it's Nikai, N-I-K-E-I. I had never seen that word before. I, and, and so my boss explained it to me. It is an individual who is of Japanese descent that immigrated to South America. And for that moment, that shining moment, I, I, I found this piece of me that I had never found before. And so, I, I'm looking forward to, to learning more and more about my Asian side, you know, finding, finding friends um, to be able to connect with and to be able to pass out what I've learned uh, to others. So I just wanna take this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about my own experience. Um, I have a, I 
still learning about my own Chinese identity because I was rerouted also. And it's just this never ending process. Anyone else? Minja. So growing up in Korea, I identified as 100% Korean. And when I moved here, I was an adult. I was in my 20s. So it's interesting because I was raised in Korea with Korean culture that even here in America, I take my shoes off when I enter a house because that's what I do back home. I also love kimchi, spicy fermented cabbage. And, you know, eating that with rice every day, that is, that's part of my Korean culture. That is what my family does. My family's still in Korea, but, and I'm the one that's here, but I still do that. And I, I think, of, and they often think about me and in, in um, my family often thinks about me here in America and thinking, oh, she, poor Minja, she has to eat bread every day. And that's not necessarily the case. And I explained that, I, you know, I'm in an area where there is a, a big Asian community and I can find other Korean foods and eat a variety of food from around the world. But I know my family worries about me a lot. So my parents came here to visit me for a week. And when they did, they finally better understood everything I'd been trying to tell them that I really wasn't missing out on some of those creature comforts I had back in Korea. So they felt quite relieved. And once they saw and got to actually visit where I, I lived, they, they better understood where I was coming from. My husband is white. And when we got married, we still followed a lot of my Korean uh, culture using chopsticks, using scissors to cut food in the kitchen, taking our shoes off before we go in the house. You know, and sometimes I'll even use my chopsticks to eat spaghetti. It's not even Asian food, but I'm just used to, to, to using them. And so my culture is something I, I truly value. Would anybody else like to add anything? Bill out. Well, interesting, looking back to when I was growing up in India, I identified as Indian because everybody around me was Indian. And, and so it was just who we were. It wasn't something I really thought about per se. It was just part of who we were. So when I came to America, that idea, excuse me, that identity came out even more because I looked so different because I was different. And because of that difference, I became so much more proud of who I was as an Indian person. And I, you know, my culture is a part of me. I eat Indian food often and I love chai and I don't go out and buy it. I make my own every day at home. I have to have it. It's just, a, it's a huge part of who I am. Thank you so much, Joey. So I grew up here in America. I consider myself first generation Filipino. I didn't learn ASL until later in life when I was 25 years old. So I miss a lot growing up. Language, culture, the reasons people did things, a lot of it went over my head because I didn't have that language access. I would see my family get together and they talk about what our grandparents did, our history, our family. And I always wanted to know what they were talking about. I always thought, oh, tell me, what are you talking about? Clarify, oh, I wanna know this. And so it was interesting to learn that my family really did have to fight a lot of barriers. And of course, within our family and culture, food is very important. It's important that you don't leave the table hungry, that you eaten enough, and maybe sometimes more than you wanna eat to the point where you tell them, no, I'm done, they keep feeding you you will, you know, they'll be like, nope, you're still hungry. You need to eat more. It really happens. But I, you know, in Filipino culture also, you have to take your shoes off before you go into the house. 
we're very clean people and, and we respect each other. We want to, we just have this energy towards each other of caring for each other. But I didn't realize some of these cultural aspects until much later because I missed a lot of it due to, to the lack of linguistic access. You know, I, I like to socialize and I eventually met the deaf community. And so that identity started appearing a little bit more than the Filipino identity. But I've always, I haven't, I haven't always fully understood my Filipino identity and culture because I was raised in America and I didn't always have access to that information in my family. And within the media, I never saw anyone that looked like me. So I really had to go out there and intentionally look for this information on my own. I often found myself at crossroads. And then in California, once I moved there, I was exposed to sign language and it blew my mind. And that's really when my identity as a deaf person came around. And I learned that how expressive I could be in sign language. And as I did that, I started learning more about myself. I started really digging deep to figure out who I am. And I was encouraged to go to Gallaudet, so I did. <laughs> and I was excited for that experience, the diversity, the socialization. And going to Gallaudet was you know, a little different than maybe what I ex originally expected. There were a lot of cliques and groups of people who already had friends. But luckily there were clubs, but I still felt different. I had gone to a school that was predominantly black students. And I didn't always feel connected completely there. And then I would go into a group of all Asians, but they were mostly East Asians and I didn't fit there. So then I went into the Latinx club. And because of the history of the Philippines, it, it, didn't, it didn't allow me to really fit there either. A little bit more than the other groups, but still not enough. But really the Filipino deaf community is so small, we're so dispersed, it's hard for us to find each other. And so when we do, we're, we're, we're together for life, but it is hard to find them. To find somebody who fully understands my experience is very, very difficult. Wow, Joey, thank you for sharing that. I mean, as we can see, everybody has, is on their own journey and has their own struggles for its identity. You know, myself as an adoptee included, people look at me and they oh, you're East Asian, which means you know this, this, and this. And I I'd say, nope, I don't. I do appreciate those who are patient with me as I learn more and more about my own Asian identity, my own Chinese identity. So I can, I can relate in a way to you. Thank you so much. So Asians have been here in the United States for a very long time. And the current events that are happening and events that I have throughout our history have been terrible. What are some misconceptions or other uh, experiences that have, have left you have left you feeling un, unsatisfied and, and feeling disappointed? Oh, geez, the misconceptions, the stereotypes, the list goes on forever. I have, I have this list and these things that have bothered me. And sometimes I, you know, just follow people around. And I don't actually say what I want. And I know I need to be more assertive. America is a big country and it is diverse, but I think what's, we have to remember is everybody is unique. Everybody has their own journey. And oftentimes people think all Asians look the same and that's not the case. They are all different. They come in different shapes, different sizes, different colors. So while a person may be exposed to one part of the Asian population, have they been exposed to the array 
of Asian cultures, the diversity that lies within our communities. Are they watching a variety of videos? Are they just watching one kind of video from a certain part of the, the of Asian representation? So I think that's a misconception. Yeah, and we do a lot of emotional labor of trying to explain who we are and what we do. Yeah, great, thank you. Anyone else? Bilal? Yeah, stereotyping misconceptions, wow. When I think about it, I think about coming, uh, coming to America and seeing all these people trying to guess where I'm from and trying to identify, oh, are you Spanish? Are you Mexican? That, so they always, they were always just trying to guess who I was without just asking me. I am a, a, a light-skinned uh, brown man with a beard. And so sometimes people assume that I am from the Middle East and therefore I'm affiliated with ISIS. If we look back to September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers fell, everyone was grieving, including myself. However, people targeted me because I had brown skin, because they assumed that I was Middle Eastern and they assumed that I was a part of ISIS. And they just assumed I was a bad person because of these misconceptions that they had. I remember being in the subway after September 11th happened. I was sitting there waiting for my train with my backpack. And I started seeing people glancing at me, giving me some side eye. And I didn't know why people were doing that. And all of a sudden a police officer appeared and he said, I wanna check your backpack. So I said, okay, I'll let him check my backpack. But everybody was watching me in that moment. And I remember talking with someone close to me wondering if I should shave my beard because I felt maybe that's why people were targeting me. And my family said, no, don't. But it's still internally, these assumptions, these misconceptions are, are, are really difficult to, to try to get through. If we look at media, you know, and, and this was prior to Facebook. So now, you know, with social media, we have more of a voice. We can have our own representation. We have the power to, to put out there who we really are. But prior to that, it was difficult. Yes, I agree that technology and social media has, has made it accessible for us to, to represent ourselves. So this is Joey speaking. Yeah, we're talking about stereotypes and I think it really depends on what you look like. I've gone through a variety of hairstyles throughout my life. I used to have it a very short buzz cut. I've had longer hair and yet for each hairstyle, they would assume I was X, Y, or Z. So, oh, that short haircut, you must be Chinese. Or with a longer haircut, you must be Samoan. And I apologize if I, if I misspelled this, but they, 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 people had different assumptions of where I was from based on my haircut and what I looked like. And this was coming from hearing individuals. So I was at a performance once and I was performing, I was uh, telling, uh, reading a book. And there was a teenager, a young teenager, maybe 10, so preteen. He was there with his family. Oh, and I had, I had a dreadlocks at the time and just a simple, you know, t-shirt. So when I was done with the show, people would come up and say, oh, you did great. And they'd come up and meet me and they'd want to shake my hand. Not everybody, but some would. And this, this boy came up to meet me. And, and, excuse me, this, this white individual came up to me and said, you, you, what, what are you? Where are you from?
and they made assumptions based on what my hair looked like. But they just kept asking me questions about who I was and had, and they really crossed the line. They didn't ask me anything about the performance or anything like that. They asked me these very personal questions that just weren't appropriate. I was exhausted. I had just gotten done dancing, but they were very much in my face just asking me these questions that cross the line, but they already had these assumptions made about me. And they, it was like a game for them. They were trying to see if they were right or not. You know, so it's hard to be authentic with individuals like that. So stereotypes, yeah, that's a challenge. Minja. Okay, this is Minja speaking. You know, often people will be like, oh, you're, you're East Asian. Why'd you, why'd you come here? Oh, you must be from a military family, right? All of these preconceived notions. But I mean, we're all individuals with our own stories. We all have our own reasons for moving here. Mine was education. And then I settled here. That's, that's just my story. And then you have kids that make the gesture where they pull their eyes back. They're, they're, they're innocent, quote unquote. Do they really know better? They'll ask you, why are your eyes like that? And they'll make that gesture. And they, they don't really know any better at that age. So I, I, I keep that in mind and I try to educate them. It is really racist to do that, but I'm at a school and many of them are doing it unintentionally. But it does make me step back and think. And just like Bilal had mentioned, where we're being targeted as Asians. We know that North Korea sometimes threatens, South Korea sometimes threatens America. We see it on the news. And we see the rockets that North Korea has, has been experimenting with. And often people are asking me about it and I have to clarify with them that, that that's not my country, I'm from South Korea. Why, why are you asking me about it like I know about this? So yeah, those are some of the precon mis uh, preconceived notions that I've experienced. Sachiko? I feel like being Asian and deaf means that oftentimes we have preconceived notions about our sign names. You know, so for a while I had this sign name, this S over by the eye, or by my eye. And then a friend of mine asked me, oh, you got that sign name because your eyes, that's why. And I was like, really, what? Oh, and so I got rid of it and I changed it to my current sign name. So just this one sign, like your sign name, like where it's placed, that can make a huge impact on you. And just the fact that it's right by your eye, it's not, it's not just your eye. It, it, there's this underlying meaning that people don't necessarily think of. And so I think being a, a deaf Asian, there are other things we need to think about. All right, Minja? Oh yeah, I wanted to just add um, to this conversation about sign names. In Korea, sign names will include the pinky if you are a woman. Like for my sign name, you can see that I have the pinky included in my name because I am a woman. But if you're a boy, you'll have the thumb included in your sign name. So maybe like an L um, with your, your thumb up on your forehead or on uh, your chin. So those have to be included in the sign names for in Korean Sign Language rules. And today, the rules are a little bit more flexible. And you know, this is my brother's sign name. It has the thumb sticking up and he's kept it that way.
And then also my sister has a similar sign name to my brother, but instead of the thumb, she has the pinky out. And then you have my sign name. So it's important to respect the rules of other sign languages, especially when they apply to sign names, because it is a part of who we are. Uh, Bilal, would you like to speak? I'm thinking about my, my experiences in India and how we use head movements to, to indicate certain communicative features, whether it's yes or no, you just naturally grow up with these. So when I moved to America, I had these natural responses, this body language of how I moved my head from Indian culture. And I remember a non-Indian person making a post about you know, the way your head moves as a communicative feature. And then I saw the comments. Oh, that's funny. Oh, look at how, look at how Indian people move their heads. And, and I started noticing that these comments were really insults. They were microaggressions. It just, I didn't, you know, I realized I couldn't necessarily get mad, but I had to educate them. So I decided to establish my own vlog and explain and, I, and make an impact and to make a change. And hopefully they can share that information with other people. It's important that we really bring awareness and bring knowledge and disperse it where we can. Yes, Joey. So I have two things I'd like to comment on. I went to, when I was growing up, I, I pretty much was with hearing people all the time. I was mainstreamed in school. And I was also the only Asian kid. There was maybe one other girl and, and we got along, but that was it. Still, she went her way and I went my way. I was in the special education classrooms and, and so we didn't see each other much, much. But I remember getting teased. I can't remember. Oh, what was my thought? I just remember, oh yeah, I was talking about bullying. So I remember I was in Fayed and you know, it was same American story in gym class. So we were lined up and I was standing in the front and I was getting ready to change my clothes. I was bored, so I was just looking around, looking around, and there was a person just sitting in front of me. I was, it was, I was a teenager, and and so I was just like, oh, who's this person? And they were looking at me, and so I was kind of interested in myself. I was like, oh, no, stop, no, 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 no. But they were really looking me over, You know, and I'm deaf and I'm just looking around, but they were looking me over and all of a sudden I was surrounded and they were making fun of me. They were pulling their eyes back and they were, they were surrounding me and they were teasing me for who I was and what I looked like. And it just, it stopped me dead in my tracks. And I realized that, wow, from here on out, I, am I gonna always be the only one? Am I always gonna, what does that mean? What does that mean for me? And I look back at that memory and that experience. I wonder, wow, I only had one other person who looked like me. And that was who I bonded with. That's who I connected with. And we didn't even get to be with each other that often. So that's something I thought of. And then for those who are in the community, they're Asian, they're alone, and they're surrounded by white individuals and how they have to 
repress all the feelings and experiences that they have and just go along with everything that's going on. Wow, I always wonder about them because I had that similar experience. Wow, thank you, Joey, for sharing. Gosh, that brings us to our last question. I mean, all of your comments and, and just, just you know, any questions, any uh, curiosities you may have, I mean, just thank you for sharing your experiences. But what are some of your suggestions or tips that you may want to throw out there to others who may be having similar experiences? Minja? Okay, now I know um, often people will ask where I'm from. And I say I live here in America for more than 10 years. And I say, well, I'm where are you from? And I'll say, well, from South Korea. And then they make assumptions of, you know, um, camps and whatnot and ask me where I'm from. And yeah, uh, it's, it's what I do. I, I go all over the place and um, I get these similar questions. And I, I, and I have to explain that I didn't grow up in America. Um, I, I have to emphasize that I'm from South Korea and you can see the looks that I get. And, um, and I know you're asking maybe how somebody may approach that, but um, there's, there's attitude too um, that I've had to um, come up against. And, you know, when I say I'm from Korea or South Korea, they'll say, oh, do you eat animals? And, you know, I'm like, do we eat animals? I'm thinking, well, no, not all Asians always eat animals. So I don't think that's an appropriate question. Maybe um, just make sure that when you come with questions that they're appropriate. Gosh, I agree with you, Minja. Uh, anybody else have any advice they'd like to share? Bilal? Now, I know a lot of people who may be unsure of others' cultures and, um, you know, for example, there's a lot of events for me as an Indian. Um, there's the holy, um, there, there's, there's different uh, events that I take part in. And um, so I suggest maybe getting involved with the different cultural events. Um, and from there, you may feel some sort of connection, feel better about yourself. Yes, I, I agree with you, Bilal. Does anybody else want to add something? Uh, Joey, we'll go with Joey first. This is Joey speaking. Uh, just a, a short little tidbit. Uh, food, food always brings community together as a culture. It's so powerful. It's a powerful tool. Uh, do not be afraid to try new things. I mean, if you haven't tried it, you know, put yourself out there. Try the foods, you know, that's one way of gaining respect. And if you don't like the food afterwards, that's okay. You still gain the respect. Put yourself out there. Try new things. A lot of respect. And don't forget, yeah, don't forget spicy foods. <laughs> uh, Min, Minja? Uh, always just keep an open mind, but an open heart too, to other cultures. You know, be willing to learn from each other. That's key. I mean, my husband himself is an American and I met him way before the 10 years that we were together. And he was just trying to learn how to sign. And uh, I was trying to tell me that his name, you know, I was introducing myself as Minja and um, we just kind of got to know each other uh, just through sign language. He didn't pay too much attention to me in the past, but then we ran into each other again and uh, his skills were a little bit better and we were able to communicate. Um, so it was just, you know, lack of uh, communication that prevented us from getting to know each other earlier. Um, but also food, as Joey said, uh, that's a big cultural thing. Um, I know that Americans are allergic or they don't want to try X, Y, and Z. Um, and, um, but Asians do eat seafood. I love seafood. <laughs> I'm, I'm crazy about it. Uh, but some people are... Um, are turned off by it. 
Uh, sometimes I will uh, make anchovies. I know it does put off the, a, a scent. Uh, my husband's okay with it. He's used to it. But when visitors come over, uh, they tend to, uh, uh, they don't appreciate the smell. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll bring food to work and I, I have to be very mindful of the type of food I bring. Um, just because, you know, I, I would like to bring any type of food that I like to work, but I have to remember that I'm educating, right? So um, if I'm teaching in a classroom and I bring it, other people are going to want to know what that smell is um, or what that, you know, they'll tell me, oh, it smells like a dead rat. And I'm like, hmm, hmm, I'm not sure about the dead rat. Where's that at? Um, maybe it's what I had for lunch. Um, cause all I had was maybe noodles with soy. So maybe they're smelling the soy. Uh, maybe that's equivalent to the dead rat. So that kind of makes me think, um, you know, I know that American people eat spaghetti noodles and I think, oh, that smells good. But what is it about Asian food? That's that doesn't put off a great scent, but again, just keeping an open mind and an open heart. Yeah. So Chico, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I want to go back to the conversation that we just had. Visibility, is it important? Um, and yeah, I do. I really do think it's important. Um, if you're Asian um, and you need to represent or you need somebody who, um, you know, has more knowledge, in-depth knowledge of the culture, it's just important to have allies. Maybe there are um, those who are Asian plus, you know, Asian Hispanic or whatnot. Um, there are those uh, that are interpreters that brought that to my attention. Um, keep that in mind when you find an interpreter who it's going to be hard to find somebody who's Japanese Hispanic. Um, or maybe it would be great if I could have two interpreters, one that's Hispanic, one that's Japanese. Um, but to just representation is important. You see them on the, was it the Crazy Rich Asians, that TV show? Whoa. I mean, the representation is there. And I'm thinking, finally. And when I watch that, I just go, wow, the visibility is so important. The culture, um, just everything about it. Cherish it. Don't push it to the side. Be proud of who it is, you know, uh, to help use those, use the media to help you figure out who you are, identify with. And thank you so much, Sachiko Bilal. Did you want to add something? Go ahead, Bilal. It's okay. It's fine. Uh, when Sachiko talked about the interpreter, it made me think of something that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, there's an Indian guy who's an interpreter. He's, uh, or interpreters, they've got strong accents, right? Um, they speak, you know, with, they're really great with their language. And then when they come to interpret, they have a very strong accent. So when I'm signing, it, you know, the interpreters will say, it's really hard to understand what they're saying because of their accent. And it's hard not to be offended by that because that's my blood. That's who I relate with. And so it's hard um, not to be offended by the interpreters, maybe facial expressions um, expressing that they don't understand what they're saying. So maybe just getting more involved um, will make me feel more involved. Mincha? And as I said, I'm an educator. And um, I, I really, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources and access to information there. And I know there's little bits of information about the African Americans or Hispanics, um, but I try to stay um, current on the events that are local, you know, like the Chinese New Year, I try to bring that to light in the classroom, which that's around January, February. Um, and, you know, but there's other Asian events as well that I, I feel are important that we need to uh, recognize. And like the Luna New Year, you know, it's the you know, there's the Chinese New Year. And I just, I feel like we need to be, you know, there needs to be more access to the information and resources that are out there. And Leanne says, I just want to add a, a few things. I have a few, I have a few friends who are Chinese that are like, you know, um, do you celebrate Chinese New Year? And I'm like, yes, of course, it's important. Um, and we celebrate that here as well. 
I just wanted to add that in there. Does anybody else want to add anything? Joey? Joey here, Joey speaking. I want to go back to the first thing that you had mentioned. Um, just that continuous story, your narrative. Please don't be afraid to share that. Put yourself out there. I just realized that recently. I just started my just started sharing my story with my family. And I never really felt fully connected with my family until I found out who I was, what I identified with. And, you know, my, my family just now they're just telling me, you know, please continue to share your story with others, you know, so just keep pushing through, put your heart out there, be yourself with people that you trust and cherish. I agree with you, Joey, old habits. Yes. Um, I'm Asian, mental health. I mean, all the stories that you guys shared today is just wonderful. Um, I think we need to do some Q&A. Are we ready? The first question is microaggression. That's just small everyday approach for, hold on one second, from other people looking at you as Asians in America. Have you guys experienced any microaggression? Joey. This is Joey. Joey speaking. Yes, especially when I went into the school system. They had high expectations of me. And so I was labeled trailblazer, if you will. You know, I was going to get involved in everything. They were just like, wow, you're going to be so smart. And it was like, no, I just happened to be put in this situation. I just put myself out there, but they didn't realize my, my prior experiences. You know, I was just barely getting by trying to get what I could, you know, um, so those high expectations were set for me and it was more of, I guess they were more encouraging, but for me, I kind of put myself to the side. I had to figure out how to process that information, how to process that, you know, with, you know, put myself up against those high expectations, feeling like I needed to explain myself. Um, I didn't meet their expectations or maybe I didn't meet the deadline or I didn't meet the American expectations. So I felt like I was constantly trying to keep up. They were looking at me like, come on, well, you should know, you, you should be a genius at math, you know, these things. And I'm over here backing up going, what is happening? You know, you're Asian, you should be smart, you, you're off the charts, you know, and I'm going, hold on for a second. Wait a minute. I just want to learn. You know, I'm going into this school system. I'm just trying to relate with people. That was my only goal. But whoa, the expectations that were set for me before I walked in. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, um, thank you, Joey. Is there anything else that you guys want to add? Bilal? Bilal? Yeah, so to that question, gosh, the list goes on the experiences that I've had. Um, I have a few examples, though. Uh, when I moved uh, here, I, I went to school. And it, this was after September 11, 2001, the event that we went through. I was in the dorm sleeping, you know, and there was writing on the door that says, you don't belong here, get out, a lot of cursing. And uh, I was just so conflicted, uh, just emotional about it. So when I flew to India and then came back, you know, the cops would always call me up to do the uh, security, the extra security check every time. And it was because of my beard, um, just because of how I per was perceived from the outside. So I noticed that my brother who was with me, he had no beard and he'd always go right by through security. And I'd say, but we're brothers, we're together. But it didn't matter. I had, you know, just, I was targeted based on my looks. And so that's just, you know, that's an example I wanted to share. Wow, Bilal. 
Sachiko, you wanted to share something? I think um, the word uh, microaggression, I, I think of deafness and deaf culture, right? Because they tend to be very direct. Is that microaggressive or is that just being deaf and being blunt? So I feel like that's a little blurry to me um, to say, you know, oh yes, that is microaggressive um, or it's not. So it, it, that's an interesting word to me. I just want to put that out there. That's true. That's true. Joey, you wanted to say something? Uh, this is Joey speaking. So yeah, um, in regards to what Sachika just said, it made me think I was uh, watching a panel and they were on, it was on uh, Caucasians and the, the language they were using and the gesturing and, and the energy that was going on. And I had to ask myself, you know, what, what is that aggression? Because um, I've been told that, you know, wow, you're really aggressive. Um, you know, people feel like they have to back up with me. Um, and I'm like, no, no, no. I, I wonder if that's how we're being looked at. So I don't know if it's the language in itself um, or if there's something, if there's more meaning behind the word or the, the microaggression, uh, microaggression. So I don't know. I agree with Sachiko when she asked that question. Yeah, and I have to admit, you know, people will say, um, you're not like anybody else. And I'm like, I'm not like Asian or what do you mean? Um, and they say that, um, you know, you need to excuse yourself or you need to do X, Y, and Z. And I think, why do, why can't I decide that for myself? Being loud or it is not a bad thing. Um, but I, so I'm owning who I am. So I agree with you, Joey. I do. Okay, let's go to the next question. Okay, one person is asking, they, they have a question. Do you know other sign languages? And do you notice if there's an attitude towards um, different languages? Is it good or bad? You know, ISL, um, there's Filipino FSL, correct me if I'm wrong, right? FSL, right? No, I don't know. Okay, sorry, FSL, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, anybody, um, perception on that? Is there attitude towards different languages? Good, bad? Joey. This is Joey speaking. Okay, so two things. I studied abroad and uh, they're more gestural. Um, they were more gestural, more welcoming, um, inclusive, whereas in America, it was by groups. Um, so if you knew someone, then you had access into that community and you were, um, you know, you were allowed. Now going to, um, as a Filipino American, Filipino deaf, there's, you know, there's, there is no, I don't really use much of the FSL, the Filipino sign language. I want to, I want to get into that organization, but I feel like there's been this um, thick boundary laid down, this hard, fast boundary that says, you know, that they're, um, they have their own group within themselves. And so I notice that they really do cherish who, within their group, who's there. They're trying to preserve the Filipino language just because of the history of it. So they're trying to capture and, and preserve um, the native language, um, Filipino sign language. So they're really trying to keep it small once until they can get it um, set in stone. So that is something that I did notice uh, as far as the differences go in languages. Sachiko? Uh, so I'm thinking of that question and I, and I challenge that question because there is different sign languages out there, right? I'm part of an international organization um, there's deaf community out there, right? And I respect their language, each of them. Uh, I want to meet them at their level, right? Um, I, I want, I, you know, I want the feedback. I, I want to think more, um, more broadly, you know? And I think, ah, um, 
to Joey's point, trying to go back and preserve the language that's been lost. You know, I know ASLs, uh, the same thing is happening with that. There's BSL. And I just feel like, you know, uh, we have a large impact on other languages from different community, uh, different countries. And so I say, be careful of teaching languages out there, but also to preserve the language that you have um, for yourself, you know, cause it could be um, disappearing as you speak, right? So how do you keep that language uh, intact? Yes, ASL is a great language to learn, but where are you from? What's your language? Now, if the roles were reversed, and you're coming to our country, as Minja just mentioned, these signs um, that we're using, the middle finger looks like it could be offensive, but it's not, not in another language, not in another country. It could mean something completely different. So we need to be very careful and respectful and understand that their language doesn't always mean the same, doesn't always translate into the same thing that ours does. You know, so sometimes it's like, come on, grow up, right? Because we've, if we're, it's this, the world is, is huge. Um, and we have a right to know our own language and cherish our own culture at the same time. Yeah, and I'd like to, you know, mention as well, you know, in India, um, you know, there's a lot of people that want to learn American Sign Language. And the reason why is because you know, even though, you know, India, we have a rich, you know, history, um, you know, the British did, you know, colonize this for over 200 years. And so, you know, the system and everything that's in place is very influenced by, you know, by the British, by the British. And so, um, you know, people look up to that and they also look up to America and, and aspire to towards that. And so, you know, with ASL and the widespread use of videos and, and other resources and things like that, and especially thanks to social media, you know, with that exploding, it's really, really um, become widespread. And, you know, once the Daily Moth really um, started going, I remember, you know, meeting them uh, and they said that the largest audience that they get sometimes is, is people from India. And people use that to get access um, and learn American Sign Language and learn about news that's going around. And so there's, um, you know, you know, with Indian Sign Language, you know, now they have their own version as well. And so the point, you know, that I really want to make is that, you know, in the, it comes back to visibility and making sure that we have representation so that way we can maintain our culture instead of brushing it aside and then losing it over time. We want to keep it, we want to preserve it. All right, Minja. And, uh, you know, you know, for me, I think it's a little bit of the opposite um, in terms of my perspective. You know, I, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, all the languages that I have, I have four languages, you know, between Korean Sign Language, American Sign Language, Korean and English. And, uh, you know, people are always, you know, curious about things that, you know, how do you sign that? How do you, you know, how does that work and things like that? And they want to learn, you know, not such, you know, appropriate words and things like that. And it's, it's a little bit of a nuisance, you know. And so that's, you know, something that, you know, has been a bother to me sometimes. Um, um, there are positives about other languages, but there are some downsides to it as well. All right, let's move on to our next question. And so how would you like to contribute uh, deaf, uh, to the deaf young generation uh, with your culture? Um, and, you know, we don't have a lot of exposure to that in schools here in America. So how would you like to contribute towards that? All right, so Chico. Well, you know, really, I think what the issue is that, you know, deaf schools, you know, that are across, you know, we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough curriculum. We don't have enough things, you know, we're getting by with a lot of those schools. And so, you know, hats off to all the teachers who work there, you know, day in and day out, 
you know, trying to make the best of every situation that they're in. And when you have all those students there, you know, that education, you know, kind of, you know, it's hard to standardize that. And so, you know, we've noticed that there's been a lot of impact just with the, uh, the education there. And, uh, you know, now we have Asian signers, for example, we need to have more exposure to that, you know, not only this month, um, but, you know, Joey, you know, talking about like sharing stories and, and giving exposure to, you know, other countries and their cultures and making sure that that, um, you know, culture keeps on getting passed on and making sure that that also gets passed on to all of our deaf schools as well. And so, um, you know, it's kind of tough, you know, I'm afraid of, you know, the misappropriation and maybe the misinterpretation of some of those things um, that are getting passed, that might get passed on. Um, but it's important to have that exposure to our children and making sure that we spread that awareness and increase their exposure with our culture and history. Yes, and you know, I think uh, Bilal might have an example. You know, it's, it's so important to, to give exposure, especially when, you know, you're younger. You know, again, I wanna emphasize that, you know, exposure, you know, waiting until, you know, it is Asian and Asian American Heritage Month and things like that, don't wait, you know, don't wait provide that exposure, provide that awareness now. And, you know, there's such a variety of things. There's so many different, you know, backgrounds and things that can be exposed, can be provided as exposure. And so, um, you know, you got to give hats off to teachers. You know, they wear a lot of hats. They have a lot of roles. And so it's important that they also see that the community around them, that there are events that go on and you encourage, you know, people to participate in them, or you invite, you know, just like what we have right now with all of our new technology, you know, you guys are using that, you know, we can, you know, with our classroom, we can invite, you know, people to come in on Zoom and things like that. And so like, instead of having someone to, you know, come fly here, we can just exchange culture and information that way. And uh, Ninja, go ahead. And, you know, as a teacher myself, yes, you know, there isn't that much access, you know, in regards to that, you know, you know, there might be a video there and I try to find maybe an Asian person that's signing it, or maybe there's a book. And I put that in there and, you know, there's really not that much access or, you know, sometimes it's very limited just depending on if the school has that resource or not. And so, you know, there are a lot of barriers to access, which means that do I have to do it myself? And man, that's really time consuming. And so I hope that, you know, there's more resources that can be made available and more culture that can be, um, you know, made aware as well. And so that way we have those things. So then that way um, we have all of those ready for our future generations. Joey, go ahead. You know, Uh, Joey speaking, you know, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's the resources, you know, my real question is, how do we, you know, contribute to all the, the higher ups who essentially do have that platform, who are designing all of that, who are providing all those resources and support, you know, how do we, you know, reach the, you know, how do we make that impact and how, we, you know, essentially increase morale in terms of providing those types of things as well. Because the more that we get support um, in terms of being uh, being able to do that, that lessens the oppression. You know, teachers already have a lot of different hats that they have to wear, and there's a lot of different things that they have to do. And so, um, you know, with all the different roles that they have to, you know, take on, you know, maybe we should think about, you know, who really holds the power in in, in being able to provide all those different things. And it's really a top-down you know, process. If we're able to collaborate and work together, then it becomes a collective you know, job instead of it, um, something that, you know, an I perspective. And so, you know, we really wanna make sure that we partner together, we welcome. Um, and then also at the same time, you know, we can say, you know, we can work towards being more effective. Yes, I agree. 
And really, you know, I have to thank, um, you know, it, t it just takes one person to support another. And that really is what, you know, gets it started, you know, and I feel like we have to thank all of those, you know, people who are doing it now. All right, so it looks like it's time. I would like to ask for all of our panels to, panelists to turn off their cameras. All right, next slide. All right, so many, many thanks um, to our wonderful interpreter team, uh, Merlin Leon, uh, Scotty Allen, and Joshua Chong. So you guys can come on camera so we can thank you guys. We'd also like to thank the uh, Convo team as well. And also our Asian signers team as well. You know, you guys really supported and made this possible. So thank you guys. And we'd really like to recognize everyone who is involved in this process. Do we have another slide? Okay, last slide right here. Oh, and we also have a exit poll as well. And so thank you guys for being here and supporting Asian Americans. Uh, we do have a donation, GoFundMe. And so you can uh, take a picture of the QR code and then also you can feel free to share this link as well. And uh, please uh, make sure that you uh, complete the uh, exit poll. We're gonna do that right now. And again, um, I'd like to thank everyone who was able to share their heart and their experience. You know, I found myself, you know, laughing and, you know, really enjoying this, but also, you know, really wanting to support everyone's identities. And also at the same time, everything that everyone has been through, you know, all of us, you know, we're watching and, you know, we kind of, we can't just step away from it and not do anything. You know, we really have to make sure that we internalize this and make sure that we can think of ways that we can contribute and support our Asian American community and also support each other as well. And so it's really, you know, their stories, it, it's authentic and we wanna thank everyone for sharing that. All right, so thank you everyone. Panelists, you can come back on camera. And I really like to recognize our three interpreters that they don't mind coming on camera one more time. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and have that uh, exit survey or that poll come up. 